Hey, it's time for another test. Um, this video is to discuss section test number two. Um, and uh, this is Phil 101, section test number two, due Monday, August 6th by 5 p.m. Um, same structure as the last test, uh, new material. Uh, we have Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics um, and uh, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, the, the Assigned Sections, plus all of the video material I posted to Moodle for you. Um, my videos are fair game. Um, I introduce problematics and ideas and tensions within the material. In those videos, um, the School of Life videos, um, and uh, one podcast uh, for Hobbes um, that I've added as well. I think it's a pretty good discussion of the dynamic that goes on in Hobbes' Leviathan. It's a good overview anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, there's all the boilerplate um, description of the section tests, 30 possible points, um, the missed exam policy. Um, basically, I'm a nice guy, but um, you have to contact me in a timely manner, um, and an extension is something we have to negotiate. Um, assignment submission, um, with regard to this section, it's exactly the same as the last time, but um, what I did notice is a number of students submitted drafts and did not click um, for their final submission. Uh, for the first test, I graded those drafts as though they were submissions, not wanting to give you zero on the assignment, considering it unsubmitted or anything along those lines. Again, I'm a nice guy. So um, I try to have your back, but um, make sure you finalize your submission. Um, if you are unsure you've submitted properly or finally or successfully, uh, email me a backup copy um, and that way you're sure I have it and we're all good. Um, I should mention the zero tolerance policy on plagiarism as well. Well, it's interesting to do secondary research. Uh, basically, the resources I've given you um, should be sufficient for you to understand this material. If you do go and do secondary research, I want that re referenced and a clear delineation between what comes out of your own head, what comes from the course material, and what comes from something external to the class um, should be made really explicit. If it's not your words, it needs quotation marks. Um, uh, so um, it, read the course and OU policies, they're on the course syllabus. Uh, with regard to that, um, again, six questions, five points each. Um, short answer questions uh, requiring a minimum of one paragraph of writing for um, your response. Um, these should be substantial uh, paragraphs, but I give you the minimum definition of a paragraph. And again, minimums are um, a good way to, uh, it's, if you just do the minimum, the result is going to be minimal. So uh, answer these questions until they are answered. I know they're substantial questions, usually asking you to do one or two, maybe three things. But nonetheless, um, this is, um, they're structured the way they are so that I can see the way you are not just defining terms, but also negotiating these ideas, um, sort of an some analysis is required, um, some connection between concepts is required, and really, that's the operative thing in a philosophy course. Um, so uh, full sentences, uh, no point form, they're too vague. I have to do too much to them in order to uh, make them make sense. And the idea is that you are demonstrating um, logical skills and analysis, uh, making inferences, and clearly presenting your ideas in the written form. These are the skills that they want us to um, develop for gen ed class. All right, so that's just what it has to do. So each of these questions are five points um, to a total of 30 points. It's three Aristotle and three Hobbes questions. First question, um, discuss the function argument um, discussed by Aristotle in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. So I want you to um, provide an overview of that function argument, um, uh, which occurs after he's done the three lives kind of thing. But the function argument is Aristotle shifting gears and attempting to define happiness and give us some sort of a strategy uh, for achieving it. 
Right, so um, the function argument is in many ways the linchpin argument um, for, for Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. It's how he's able to go on and claim everything else that he claims. Right? So the question is, after you give an overview, how by this argument does Aristotle arrive at his definition of happiness? Right? So how does the function argument provide a definition for happiness. Five points. Right, that should be straightforward. Um, it's in the videos. I discuss it um, really well. Um, I think I think I gave you the example of um, the beer store guy. Aristotle is looking for something a lot more general than that specific example, but nonetheless, that'll give you the mechanics of the argument. He's looking for a way to generally define a human function and generally define um, the virtue with regard to it, right? So, and ultimately happiness, which is, as you know, an activity of the soul in accord with virtue. So, um, that's question one. Question two, um, in book two, you see the way this is going. In book one of the Nicomachean Ethics, he does this important thing. In book two of the Nicomachean Ethics, he does this other important thing. And then question three is going to be in book three, section one. That's all you're responsible for. Um, of the Nicomachean Ethics, um, uh, it, 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 he does this other important thing. So. Uh, three questions, three books, um, one pertaining to each book. So, second question. In book two of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle defines virtue of character and discusses how it's developed. What do I want you to do? Define virtue of character and briefly discuss how it's developed. Right? The same way we get to Carnegie Hall. Right? In book two, section four of the Nicomachean Ethics, so what you would do is turn to oh, book one, book two, and section one, two, three, and four. Uh, virtuous actions vir versus virtuous character is the title of book three, or uh, book two, section four. So. Right, the second part of this question. In Book 2, Section 4 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle identifies three requirements um, for genuine virtue, starting with the quotation, but surely actions are not enough. That's on your page 22, if you have the same version of the Nicomachean Ethics as I asked you to buy. Um, discuss each of these requirements, and by discuss, I don't mean list, I mean discuss what he means by them. Um, I go over them quite quite thoroughly in the videos that I gave you, so you should have lots of background for that. So, um, question three. In book three, um, section one of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle draws a distinction between what he considers properly involuntary and a category of actions that he concer uh, uh, terms non-voluntary. First, Introduce the general category of voluntary actions. Remember, in my 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 my, my video, I uh, sort of express a little bit of frustration with the way that Aristotle discusses the involuntary. Involuntary actions are this narrow category of of two possible kinds of actions occasioned by um, either force or ignorance. So discuss that generally. And, um, but after you do that, so that's the first thing you should do. Next, discuss the distinction between properly involuntary actions and those actions that he terms non-voluntary, followed, so third, by a brief discussion of why Aristotle would add this distinction. Right. So I want the root of the distinction between Aristotle's treatment of non-voluntary and involuntary actions and um, why he would add this distinction. Um, remember in the video I pointed out there that there is a great footnote. It is um, squiggle 13 on your page 203, four of someone's dot 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 no pain. It reads, the distinction between the non-voluntary non and the involuntary is irrelevant to the agent's, agent's relation to the action, for in either case, he's not responsible for it. 
but it is relevant to his character, etc., etc., etc. It's a great explanatory note. It's one of the reasons why I picked this copy of the Nick and McKean Ethics for you to read. So, um, that will give you some background for the final part of Book 3, um, Section 1, Question 3 of your exam. So, um, that is Aristotle. Now, just a quick overview. Aristotle, um, you know, basically, it's, I, I like his approach to ethics because it bases ethics in something that we already, by our very nature, want. Right? But he relies on a determinate category of happiness. That is a definition of happiness by which he comes to, it, 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 like by it, it, which he comes to through um, the function argument that you discussed in question one. Aristotle is able to make all of his claims about virtuous actions and virtuous character and developing virtues and uh, laying out a way of life for human beings, which is best in which we flourish by that definition. I mean, essentially, Hobbes wants to argue that there is nothing in terms of a definition of happiness, there is nothing in, in terms of a metaphysics right, that really pertains to human beings or grounds in ethics or further a political philosophy. Right? So no normative or should claim right, can be grounded metaphysically or definitionally. In fact, Hobbes' definition of happiness is simply getting what we want and avoiding that which we don't want. Right? It's rooted in desire and ultimately the desire for power after power which ceases with our death. Right? So, effectively, happiness cannot ground in ethics or politics. <coughs> so, that's the major distinction between Aristotle and Hobbes. So it's interesting to look at Hobbes' philosophy in terms of uh, what happens if everything comes down to this rather bleak account of human desire and self-interest. What if, as Hobbes claims, all moral philosophy is grounded in um, uh, the laws of nature? That is, quick and ready calculations of self-interest. If all human regulatory contact, uh, conduct is grounded in self-interest, then what sort of political arrangement do we need? So, three questions on Hobbes. Um, the first one goes straight for um, what I call the Hobbesian bargain between uh, the state of nature and the, the state of peace, that is, the commonwealth. Right? Hobbes introduces a rather bleak account of human nature and describes, quote, the natural condition of mankind in detail. What I want you to do is briefly introduce both his conception of human nature and the state of nature. Mm -hmm. Followed by a discussion of how, according to Hobbes, the state of nature, or natural condition of mankind, arises as a consequence of his account of human nature. So it's not quite enough to go, human nature is, the state of nature is. Show how the, the, the human nature leads, by Hobbes' argument, I don't need you to agree with it, but nonetheless, by Hobbes' argument, leads directly to a state of nature. And it, 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 it extracting all sort of institutional and power structures right, that are currently in place. What happens if there is no state? What happens if there is no 911 to call? What happens if etc. etc. Right? And um, Hobbes on 184, trusting my memory. No, no, it's 189, isn't it? No, it's 187. Huh. Six. Yeah. Um, it, it, in the key paragraph in chapter 13 where he discusses the, the natural condition of mankind, 
Uh, this is the big quote, and I'll quote it to you again. Whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, the same is consequent to the time wherein men live with, without other security than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal. So, we're relying on our original power, all right? Not the trappings that we get from participating in a society. This is our original power. In such a condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain. Right? So if I build something and try to sell it to someone, that someone is just as likely to take it from me and club me to death with a rock. And consequently, no culture of the earth. No culture, because we need to cooperate for culture. No navigation or use of commodities that may be imported by sea. Again, cooperation. No commodious building, because it's commodious building. No instruments for, uh, of moving and removing such things as require much force. Nobody to grab the other end of the couch. No knowledge of the face of the earth. No account of time. No arts. No letters. No society. And what is worst of all continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Right? This is all if we are the self-interested creatures that Hobbes lays us out to be. This is the consequence by his argument. Right? So, um, basically what I want you to do is follow Hobbes' thought experiment. Define human nature, define the state of nature, and follow the thought experiment to show how the one, by Hobbes' argument, leads to the other. Right? Now, to a certain extent, right, this is even an expansion of Plato. Right? Remember, Plato was skeptical about whether or not we could rule ourselves because we're so desirous and so little rational. Right? Unlike Socrates, who thought democracy is possible because we were capable of self-rule, Hobbes thought we needed to be ruled by those who can calculate what's truest and best, that is, philosophers who um, live the life of reason and have brought harmony to their souls. Right? So, uh, the best should rule. Those most fit to rule should rule. Right? Hobbes goes a step further because Plato relied on some sort of a metaphysical sort of knowledge. Right? If there's no such thing as a metaphysical sort of knowledge, if reason is really a complicated calculator for threat and advantage and appetite and aversion, right? there's no metaphysical truth that contains a moral truth to pin everything to. It comes down to self-interest, which leads into um, the next question. If we are capable of self-rule, left to our own devices, we get uh, question four, right? A state of nature in which we're at each other's throats, right? Constantly ready to do battle with one another. Everyone is enemy to everyone, right? In chapter, or in chapter 14, and to some extent in 15, Hobbes um, it, it, it distinguishes between what he calls a right of nature and the laws of nature. These are, to some extent, the things that are going to lead us out of this miserable condition of war as is of everyone against everyone. Right? So what I want you to do is define the right of nature and the laws of nature, which I've already told you are quick and ready calculations of uh, self-interest. Like, there are bloody 19 of them that, 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 that Hobbes lays out. So I've got a note here. I do not need a list of the laws of nature. I don't want you to list all 19 of them. Don't do it. I don't want to read it. You don't want to write it. But it would perhaps be good to introduce the first law, right? which you find right at the beginning of chapter 14 after he defines the right of nature. Right? The first law of nature is essentially conditional, too. You should note that. Right? Now, in the same section, Hobbes introduces the idea of a covenant right? as a stronger form of contract. Why are covenants important to Hobbes' argument? Right? Remember, chapter 14 is where we're trying to transition from the state of nature, the state of war, as is everyone against everyone, 
to a conjecture about the possibility of peace, the laws of nature, and contracts and covenants seem to be convenient articles of peace by Hobbes argument. So what I want you to do, right, is in question five, think about how we get from this deep distrust of one another to a condition of peace. Huh? Not quite there. Then finally, question six. Discuss the covenant that gives rise to the Commonwealth introduced by Hobbes in chapter 17. Being sure to cite the covenant itself found on page 227. And I'm just going to read it to you. It seems really stupid, but the first thing I want you to do, uh, it, this is, I've, I've got a reason I'll explain it in a second, is put this in quotation marks or put it in italics or something like that and right at the beginning of your response actually quote this covenant. I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or this assembly of men on this condition that thou give up thy right to him and authorize all his actions in like manner. This done, it, well, I don't need you to keep going after that. That is the covenant. Everything in italics there is the covenant. All right? So, start off by quoting it. That's one point. If all you do is quote that covenant, you get one point. It's one out of five on that question. Believe it or not, that's the way it... it if you fail to or forget to or don't, the best you can do is four out of five. That's that's worth a point. So, quote it, right? And then discuss the covenant that gives rise to the Commonwealth, uh, introduced by Hobbes in chapter 17. Remember in chapter 16, um, he notes that a multitude of men are made one man, man when they are by that one man, excuse the misogynistic language, uh, represented. Right. Uh, boo, 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 here it is on your page 220. A multitude of men are made one person when they are by one man or one person represented. Hobbes is actually a little bit better than my memory of Hobbes. Uh, so it be done that, um, uh, done with the consent of everyone um, of that multitude in particular. For it is the unity of the representer, not the unity of the represented, that make one, uh, the person one. And it is uh, the representer that beareth the person, and but one person and unity cannot otherwise be understood in the multitude. Right? Remember, we're all particular, right? But when we pick a representative, that one person bears the person of all of us because we all authorize his actions. That's effectively what's happening in this covenant that gives rise to the commonwealth. Right? That's why the weird chapter there. Right? So, briefly discuss how this covenant, which establishes sovereign power, breaks down the distinction between public and private good in the person of the sovereign. This is an interesting feature right, of Hobbes' argument. When we enter into that commonwealth arrangement, this is Hobbes' thought. Right? Remember, each and every one of us are driven by self-interest. And when each and every one of us consider the public good next to what is good for us as individuals, each and every one of us, by Hobbes' analysis, since we're only driven by self-interest, are going to choose what is good for us indiv individually. This is the problem he's trying to solve. But... When, with mutual covenant with one another, we authorize one person to bear the person of all of us, that person is only as wealthy or as powerful as the multitude. Right? I mean, who's more powerful? The leader of a wealthy and powerful nation or 
the leader of a nation in which the multitude is impoverished. Who's more powerful? Well, guess what? It's going to be the wealthy nation. That is more powerful. So, effectively, what Hobbes is trying to do in the Leviathan is harness the self-interest of one individual, any one individual. It doesn't matter who. Why? Because none of us are trustworthy. None of us. Each and every one of us, by Hobbes' analysis, you can disagree with it, I don't need you to agree with it, but what if it's true, what Hobbes is claiming? That each and every one of us are completely governed by self-interest, and each and every one of us, when given the choice between promoting the public good and promoting our own private interests, will choose our private interests every time. Well, what we're going to need is a way to harness the private interests of this one individual and tie those to the public good. So this, so uh, this covenant that gives rise to sovereign power, to the commonwealth, is meant to break down the distinction between uh, the public good and private self-interest so that in the person of the self, uh, sovereign, they can be self-interested all they like. And guess what? If they're at all rational and at all able to calculate, they will see that the best way to pursue their self-interest is to promote the public good. That's the argument, anyway. Right? So, um, what I want you to do is basically address that argument. Step one, cite the covenant. Step two, discuss the covenant. Step three, discuss how this covenant breaks down the distinction between private good and the public good right in the person of the sovereign easy peasy right i know it's not easy peasy um but nonetheless um there's a mechanism to uh answering each of these questions basically um you have to do what i just did for you is break the question down into its various parts and make sure you address based on your understanding of the readings, based on your notes that you've taken as you're watching the videos, uh, answer to the best of your ability each part of this question. I'm asking you to do a few things, right? So, um, on the last test, if, if there were problems, and there weren't problems with everyone's, right, I read some absolutely beautiful responses to uh, the previous test, right? But, right, if there were problems, it was because, well, one of two things. One, uh, the author lost focus. Right? They stopped focusing on what was asked in the question. They didn't get a good understanding of what the question was asking of them. Or, they answered one part, but not the whole question. Right? That's, that's generally uh, what was falling short if it was falling short on the last test. So um, all of my comments on the last test were meant to be therapeutic, meant to point you in the right direction, meant to draw more of the theory out of you. Um, in some cases I was commenting, seeing what you argued, I was expanding it a little bit in an interesting way, right? Making another connection with the material and that sort of thing. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it's it's don't don't be um, alarmed by the amount of writing on your previous test. Um, I'm trying to be therapeutic. I'm trying to point you in the right direction. I'm trying to show you the mechanism that's in place for you to succeed by breaking down these questions into their various parts. Right? So um, to improve, if you need to improve, if you want to improve. Um, it, that's the way you do it, right? So, for example, um, in question two, uh, define virtue of character. That's the first thing. He calls virtue of character and habitual disposition to our emotions resulting in states of character, that is, propensities to act, which we evaluate in terms of the golden mean of moderation. Oh, I introduced the golden mean of moderation. I should probably tell you what that is. 
Aristotle notices that virtuous actions are ruined by extreme states of excess and deficiency, so that gives us a target to aim at. Right? Now, um, how do we develop virtue of character? Huh, practice, 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 by repeating the same sorts of actions over and over. And you see, I'm just giving you the answer to this question, but nonetheless, I'm showing you how to break it down into its parts. Now, in uh, Book 2, Section 4, well, we should turn to Book 2, Section 4. Book 2, Section 4, which is on your page 22, so let's get there. All right, um, and I even quoted you a little section. Oh, squiggle 2, paragraph 2, but surely actions are not en enough, even in the case of crafts, for it's possible to produce a grammatical result by chance or by following someone else's instructions. Remember, that's the uh, example I didn't like. So it's possible to produce a good sh golf shot by chance or by following someone else's instructions. To be good golfers, then, we must both produce the good golf sh shot and produce it in terms of the golf knowledge within us. Right. So, a little further down in paragraph 3, he introduces, rather, the agent must be in the right state when he does them. First, he must know that he's doing virtuous actions, why do we need, need knowledge? And I go over that in the video. And second, he must decide on them and decide on them for themselves, right? it, which is something interesting that we don't see again until um, the, 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 the modern period, the Enlightenment, right? in terms of ethics. Right? So it turns out the intention behind the action actually matters. And third, he must do them from a firm and unchanging state, because a single swallow does not bring the spring. Um, a single virtuous action does not make a virtuous character. You've got to produce a tendency to act. Right? So, that's the analysis I want there. All right? I know I'm asking for a lot, and I know this probably seems like a pain to you, but nonetheless, um, this is what we need to do in order to fulfill the function of a philosophy course. I'm not just trying to be a jerk here. Right? Plus, I know you can do this. It's going to take some practice, it's going to take some effort, it's going to take some thought, it's going to take some discussion. Right? But nonetheless, you can do this. And I think you'll find it to be rewarding. You'll be able to make more sense of what you read, you'll be more, more able to write your ideas in a compelling and persuasive kind of manner. These are skills that will, in either sense, an Aristotelian or Habesian sense, help you get what you want. Whether that's the good life, a life well lived, a state of flourishing, or simply what you want when you want it. Right? Either way, these skills, both Aristotle and Hobbes would note are productive. Even Plato and Socrates noted this. Right? Uh, the wise man is 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 preferable to the or not preferable is 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 the superior of the, the unwise man. Right? This is something that came out in the Phaedrus, right? In Socrates' first speech. Right? In the Credo, he notes that we shouldn't pay attention to just anyone's opinion. Basically, we should pay attention to the opinions of wise people who've thought this through in some sort of a systematic, rational kind of way. Right? So you become more powerful and more able by developing these skills. Anyhow, that's the end of my sales tactic. Um, if you're unsure what these questions are asking you to do, please send me an email and I can help you. The discussion forums are there as your rough workspace. Um, I, I give you grades for trying to figure out what's going on here. Right? Not just having figured it out, but trying to figure it out. So use the discussion forums if you're lost um, with regard to the content of this. And then if, you, 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 if you're unsure what I'm asking altogether or need me to break it down in a more detailed kind of way, I will do so. Send me an email. Okay? Um, have good days, one for each of you, and I look forward um, to uh, seeing your responses before August 7th um, at 5 p.m. Don't leave it to the last minute. Give yourself plenty of time. And one more thing I should add, proofread your responses. 
to make sure because if you say one thing here and contradict it there that's a detractor all right um all right have good days one for each of you take care